All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. So uh, even with a chronological historical narrative that has run throughout the week, I'm sure you've noticed that we have been resisting the temptation to try to tie things up neatly. And uh, I'm going to try to resist that temptation today in our closing session um, to, try to try to resist the temptation to try to imagine the future or tie things up. Um, but I do want to try to see whether we can build a bridge a little bit <clears throat> from 1747 and 67 to 2017 and to try to use today's session to, little, to think a little bit about what stands before us in terms of the decision making, the thought processes, the ideas for the Jewish people as a Zionist exercise, um, given that we are a people <clears throat> on whom it's not just that history acts upon us, but we have treated for a long time uh, history as the catalyst for responsibility, history as a catalyst for activism. It's actually um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I've been excited and, and anxious about today's teaching is because it has felt like an opportunity to revisit a topic that I thought about a lot prior coming to the Institute, but have not done a tremendous amount of teaching about while I've been here, which is about Jewish memory and Jewish history, and the ways in which Jews have thought about our past as means of defining who we are in the present and what we want to be in the future, or I'll put it differently. The way, oftentimes in classical Jewish history, Jews operated with two notions of time, two notions of sacred time. Uh, an appreciation of the sacred time of the past and an appreciation of the sacred time of the future. And if you think with those terms, then it enables you to imagine that you are kind of living in the present as a bridge between the past and the future. There's a famous rabbinic text which talks about how the present is simply a prose door, a hallway, in between the sacred past and the sacred future. And one of the great challenges of Zionism and of modern Jewish history is the urgency of living in actual real time with real politics and the need to articulate the sacred tasks that operate in the present and not merely to operate with some notion of sacred time in the past and in the future. So one of Judaism's big ideas and articulated throughout this week but not explicitly is that the past and the future are oftentimes intertwined that even though Jewish history as a discipline is relatively new, in the past, Jews thought about the past a lot, but hadn't become, didn't, hadn't developed the discipline of Jewish history, a Jewish historical consciousness is quite old. And the way in which Jews oftentimes thought about the past in the past was not in reference to history, not trying to scientifically understand what had happened to them, but through this other more complicated discipline of memory thinking about the past as something which obligates us and animates us and gives us a whole set of responsibilities that tie together what came before to what we think comes next. So the challenge I want to do in this session is to bridge a little bit between all of this history that we have been studying and the future which we can't know and to try to think about how that implicates who we want to be politically in the present. One of the features that's consistent in modern Israel is that <clears throat> It's not just that history dictates how people think about politics. So for instance, it's not a surprise, to me at least, that Prime Minister Netanyahu's father was a historian. It's actually, there's a lot you could do there when the, when the biography ultimately is written. But that in modern Israel, how we think about politics has often also been the way in which we shape how we think about history. This is a famous story in a lot of Israeli historiography. One of the best examples in 1983, a former general and political theorist named Yehoshaphat, with the unlikely name of Yehoshaphat Harkabi, published a book called The Bar Kokhba Syndrome on, um, on risk and realism in international politics. And for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, the Bar Kokhba rebellion became front page news in Israeli newspapers. In fact, it also got picked up later in the New York Times because the New York Times wanted to talk to its audience about how an old and lost war could become front page news in Israel. Harkabi challenged the orthodoxy around the Bar Kokhba rebellion that had emerged since the creation of the State of Israel. The Bar Kokhba rebellion, you'll recall, was a second Jewish revolt that took place against Rome between the years 132 and 135 CE, roughly 60 years after the destruction of the temple. 
uh, with the folly of a, a character um, uh, named Shimon, last name unknown, who was known as Bar Kochva, the son of a star. We'll explore that a little bit later. It captures some messianic language in Jewish tradition and who led a second guerrilla-based war against the Roman Empire. The Jews seem to have been like two, two of the three revolts that took place against the Roman Empire were the Jews. Um, and, uh, and the result of, whereas the result of the first revolt, the, the result of the first revolt against Rome in the year 70 had resulted in the destruction of the temple. In other words, the loss of the central symbol of Jewish sovereignty. But it has not, had not been catastrophic to the same degree to the Jewish population. By the second time the Jews revolted in the year 132 CE, the Romans had lost patience. And as a result of the fact that the conduct of the, of the second revolt had been through guerrilla warfare, which had resulted in the loss, loss of a lot of Roman lives, the consequence of the Bar Kokhba rebellion was an absolute massacre by the Roman army of the populations in Judea. According to lore, they they, they raised the entire city of Jerusalem, sowed it with salt so it would never be rebuilt, and made it for at least a stretch of time Judenrein, prohibited Jews from living in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Whether it's actually true or the mythic story, it's hard to know. Nevertheless, since the creation of the State of Israel, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion had emerged as one of the stories of Jewish pride and power and nationalism and sovereignty. That is, the willingness of a small population living within a hostile empire to stand up for its own pride and its own dignity. You can see how quickly stories like that begin to emerge as part of a consciousness. And when, when Harkabi writes this piece in 1983, not a, not a coincidental date for the writing of this piece in light of the Lebanon War and just a few years before the first intifada, Harkabi meant to challenge the orthodoxy that Bar Kokhba rebellion was actually something that was supposed to be celebrated in Jewish history and said, and said instead that Bar Kokhba represents the folly of Jewish messianic politics. We think that this is what we're supposed to do, and we focus on the pride and joy of the peace of the Bar Kokhba rebellion that signaled the rise of Jewish pride and power, and we forget about the consequences of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which, which were so catastrophic. And by doing so, Harkabi was naming and putting out for the Israeli population that they were gravitating towards a particular narrative of Jewish history that was shaped by their own political instincts. And this is correlated and has been verified many times in many different ways by sociologists and historians over the past 30 or 40 years. There's a magnificent article in which um, a social, social scientist followed around tour guides on Masada over a five-year stretch and charted the ways in which the newspaper's political events were shaping the nar narration of what actually took place on Masada. Most famously being that in the immediate aftermath of the Rabin assassination, the tour guide stopped talking about the heroism of the zealots who had fled to Masada, and instead the message became, Masada is the chronicle of what happens when zealotry takes over a society. In other words, we have this unbelievably rich history. We think that we are actually a place in modern Israel that is thinking in reference to actual history, but we are subconsciously, perhaps because we've come at it honestly over our many years, doing the work of memory all the time, namely taking these pieces of historical event and translating them and transforming them into the stuff that actually animates um, the consciousness that we have. And so part of the question that I want us to be thinking about today is when we look at the Jewish future, the first question that we want to ask is what story of the past do we think we're living in? <laughs> right? Not knowing that has been a kind of constant tension for us as Jews is when we ask about the future, we first have to ask about the past. And I come at this um, recognizing the amount of extraordinary anxiety that exists in the Jewish people and in the state of Israel about what is next, uh, especially as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, especially as this conflict, which I think, the, um, I think the Hebrew word is a little bit better for describing the conflict, which is the sikhsuch, in other words, the mess. Um, 
that is though because a conflict suggests that that okay you have a conflict and then you have a resolution you have a problem and then you have a solution whereas a mess suggests that the disentanglement of what has to happen in order to resolve this conflict is much more complex than the quick solutions that we imagine i'll just reference um i've referenced i think it here before um there's a tremendous article that came out, I think, on Medium, maybe a year or two ago, by, I think, Courtney Martin. It was titled, The Reductive Seduction of Other People's Problems. It's worth reading. Um, in which she argues that distance from a, from a problem inclines people to believe that they are capable of solving it. <laughs> That's the irony of complicated problems. And proximity to problems reminds us of quite how difficult it is. And the example that she offers is that um, there are just hundreds of patents on record in the West for technical solutions to African water problems. <laughs> because if you're sitting wherever you are in the West and you imagine that what the problem that is being encountered somewhere else is merely a technical problem and I could come up with all of the technology in order to solve it, um, and lo and behold, when you actually arrive and you discover all of the social and environmental and religious uh, factors that prohibit um, such a solution, it becomes obvious that you actually would have to do tremendous amount of different work rather than simply designing the patent. And the paradox, of course, is that for the same people who are sitting wherever they are designing a solution for somewhere else in the world, there are immediate problems down the block from wherever it is that they live, their own public school, let's say, that they are aware of what they would have to do in order to solve, which disincentivizes them from wanting to solve their problems. In other words, distance from this conflict actually invites solutionism, right? Invites the belief that this can be solved, whereas proximity to the conflict um, reminds us of quite how difficult it is to disentangle its challenges. The reductive seduction of other people's problems? Um, well, I think you can just, I think it's Courtney Martin, but I think you can just Google that phrase and you'll be able to find the article. The reductive seduction of other people's problems. Um, nevertheless, especially given the complication and the mess, especially given the ways in which characters and players on the ground here in Israel have been involved not just passively in, cre in, in, in the evolution of this conflict, in the evolution of the sikhsukh, but have been engaged very proactively in what is called uvdot bashetach, creating new facts on the ground, makes it very difficult to imagine the way in which this conflict is gonna be solved, which generates enormous anxieties that invite individuals to use these milestone events, especially this 50-year milestone of 2017, uh, as means of um, catalyzing action out of fear of inevitability, right? That's, what, that's what's one of the things that's happening to us psychologically, is that if we, as we hit a 50-year marker, the fear is 50 years means this is a path that we are down that will never change. We do this, by the way, with milestone birthdays also. Right? This is why people get anxious and nervous and make resolutions around milestone birthdays, is because you believe you've, sit, you've hit a certain threshold, nothing is gonna change unless I actually change it myself. Right? So the panic of inevitability <coughs> um, and the fear that realities are growing and becoming entrenched beyond our control invites people uh, to, to think that, that milestone anniversaries are moments for action. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are visible both on the right and on the left. So it's not a surprise, for instance, that over the last couple of years, and especially this year, you hear more on the right about entrenching the conditions uh, of the occupation and translating them to use Tal's technical terms from occupation to annexation. It's not a coincidence that it's happening now um, out of a sense of let's make permanent a status that has been temporary for all too long. And it is not a coincidence at all that there's a rise of anti-occupation activism on the left out of a fear, once again, of 50 years is too long, 50 years is enough. We have to make sure that we stop it now because, and what's implied in both of these positions, failure to stop it now means that it becomes permanent history. I want to talk today about what stories of history do these politics, do the politics of urgency imply? 
And how should our stories of our own history inform what Jewish activism can look like going forward? Um, you know, spoiler alert, <clears throat> no easy answers. Um, and I think we're gonna have to continue to find ourselves located between uh, a sense of urgency that I think is important about milestone history, and at the same time, a sense of humility in recognizing that processes of historical change transcend the mere milestone markers that we encounter, and that sometimes, paradoxically, the urgency to act in history becomes, as Harkabi indicated, um, um, actually, uh, <laughs> undermines our actual capacity to create change. So I want you to look together with me at the sources, the, the orange source sheet. I want to look first at what I think has been um, one of the dominant stories for the Jewish people in thinking about history and the passage of time, and the version of history as it relates to the passage of time that invites the greatest sense of political urgency. And that story is the story of messianic history and translated into messianic politics. Messianic history imagines that history comes to a certain end, that milestones become markers to transform the world that you know, and that you can actually, with one sw fell swoop, under the leadership of an extraordinary individual invested with a tremendous amount of community, communal authority, actually transform the world that you have into the world that you want. Messianism is predicated on that gap, that there's the world that we have and the vision, the aspiration of the world that we want. Messianism in the passive sense suggests that that world eventually will be transformed. Messianism in the active sense, that is messianic politics, means that there are things that individuals can do that can close the gap quickly from the world that we have to the world that we want. One of the famous stories to this effect, one of the texts that I think is being cited more than others um, in this 50 years of, uh, since 67, is the text that I want to study together with you first, which is from Leviticus 25, the story of the Yovel, the story of the Jubilee year. The, the biblical commandment of the Jubilee year is unbelievable. It is truly unbelievable, so unbelievable, in fact, that it probably was never practiced. Right? And I want to explore together why it is. Well, how can it be that we have told a story to ourselves about one of Judaism's commandments, one of our obligations, that in rabbinic history is imagined to have been so difficult as to have been implausible? And one of the things we're going to notice is that it imagines a messianic politics, the capacity to blow the shofar and transform one's society that is in and of itself recognizes its own limitation, its own failures, of the, that you simply can't do that. That I both feel drawn to the temptation of what the Yovel wants us to do, and at the same time, I am unmade in that story from my actual capacity to do so. Leviticus 25 starts, with the first, um, the first six verses tell us about the Shemitah, which does get observed and continues to get observed, the sabbatical year, um, which says as follows, I'll read quickly, and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land which I give you, the land will observe a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in the pr produce thereof. But on the seventh year, the land shall have a Shabbat of complete rest, a Shabbat of the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You can't reap the aftergrowth. It will be a year of complete rest for the land. You may eat whatever of the land during the Shabbat will produce you, your male and female slaves, etc. You shall count off um, your cattle, your beasts, and your field may eat all of its yield. Okay, so the first seven verses describe these first seven years. And you'll notice the continual repetition that this is something that the land has to observe. You, in this story, are a relatively passive consumer. The land has to have a Shabbat to the Lord, and you can imagine the theory underlying this, which is that human beings also mark six days and then rest, and the land also has to mark six days and then rest, and don't ask too many questions about what that means, right? About the, 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 the transformation of the land into a kind of physical being, right? That actually also has to mark a Shabbat. 
But then we get to the crux of this, um, the text for the purposes of this class. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times, seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives you a total of 49 years. I know you're not supposed to think that there are things in the Bible that are superfluous, but I think there are some pieces of this sentence that are a little superfluous. I know seven weeks is 49 years. Then you shall, and this is important, then you shall sound the horn loud in the seventh month on the 10th day of the month, the day of atonement, and Yom Kippur, you shall have the horn sounded throughout your land, and you shall hallow the 50th year. You shall proclaim release throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return to his holding, and each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow, neither shall you reap the aftergrowth or harvest the untrimmed vines. For it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You may only eat the growth direct from the field. So a couple of things to notice. Number one, one thing to notice is that this is not a Shabbat for the land. This is a jubilee for you. So we switch already from the idea of the sabbatical as marking something that has to do with the land to the jubilee as a marker for Israelite society. This is not about the land anymore. This is about you. Number two extraordinary thing here is that you are the one who does the hallowing. You're the one who makes it holy. The Shabbat of the, of the Shemitah seemed to be something that happened automatically to the land and seems to have been hallowed or consecrated as part of the creation process by God. Whereas the hallowing and consecrating that takes place in the Jubilee year is something that you do. Without you as the actor in this story, that will not happen in and of itself. And the drama is unbelievable. You blow the shofar on, on, on Yom Kippur, and suddenly all land ownership winds up reverting back to its original condition. The problem that the Shemitah seems to be solving is something to do with the fact that the land needs to rest. The problem that the Yovel seems to be solving has nothing really to do with land. The problem that the Yovel is solving are the dysfunctional social orders, the economic problems that emerge organically in a society over the span of a passage of time. That by the time you get, to, you can have a completely ideal economic structure for a society. Right, remember the Israelites had come into the land, had divided up the land relatively equitably, and then had tried to build a model society with all sorts of ways in which people are supposed to take care of one another. But things like debt, which is meant to be an economic tool of empowerment, eventually wind up creating inequities. Certain people become wealthy, certain be people become poor. Debt has consequences of translating into debt slavery. People lose access to their land. Over the span of two, maybe three generations, the land has gotten to a place where it is actually serving as an impediment to the building of an ethical society, rather than the instrument for the building of an ethical society. And what the Bible wants us to do in a moment like this is that every 50 years you say, stop reset the entire economic order, and everybody goes back to their original land holdings. Blow the shofar, and suddenly everyone will remember, it's like unbelievable, everyone will remember that we're not supposed to be as bad of a society as we have become. Right? Blow the shofar and end the occupation. Right, that's what this, it's so, the 50 years thing on, and the reallocation of land is so on the nose in Leviticus 25 to imagine that there can be certain moments where all you have to do is have a built-in ritual symbol. All you need are individual leaders capable of coming along and radically transforming the society to reset it back to the place where it was meant to be. And therefore, as a result, it goes on to say, in, in the, in the, uh, you know, this is, this is a jubilee, it's holy to you. We're not that interested in the land anymore. We're interested in what you need to do in order to make the society what it's supposed to be. But built into this problem, um, built into this idea, built into this theology, is a recognition of its flaws. <laughs> Right? It's not just that this doesn't get observed as though Ju the Jewish people encounter this first half of the text and then fail to do the Jubilee for the rest of their lives. But as you go on later in the text, you start to hear the Bible sowing the seeds of its own anxiety about this obligation. 
Anxiety number one, read verse 14. When you sell property to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. In buying from your neighbor, you shall deduct only for the number of years since the jubilee, and in selling to you, he shall charge you only for the crop years. The more such years, the higher price you pay. The fewer such years, the lower the price, for what he's selling is a number of harvests. Anxiety number one, is that if land ownership starts to get reset every 50 years, aren't people going to start doing terrible things to each other in the lead up to the 50th year? Right? Yeah, yes? Not ready for questions yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure this is true on a human level. The Bible knows this anxieties and is naming them. In the lead up to a transformation of the society and world order, this is a natural activity that humans are gonna do, even knowing that they're all obligating themselves to the Yovel. So problem number one built into the Yovel is that people will manipulate each other and do terrible things in anticipating that. And therefore, answer number one that comes from the Bible is verse 17, do not wrong one another, but fear your God, for I, the Lord, am your God. Right? There actually is a guarantor in this system. And it's not you. You might think that this is a moment to take advantage of one another because, you know, you maximize your economic profit as much as you can before the end of days. But by the way, I'm watching. But the second anxiety that emerges later on is more powerful. Um, you shall observe my laws and faithfully keep my rules that you may live upon the land in security. The land shall yield its fruit and you shall eat your fill and you shall live upon it in security. Do you notice a recurring phrase here? La vetach and la vetach in 18 and 19 in security. And you shall ask, what are we gonna eat in the seventh year if we may neither sow or gather our crops? And the, the text concludes, the land must not be sold beyond reclaim, for the land is mine. You are but strangers resident within me, right? Um, resident with me. This phrase of security captures the second core problem, the second anxiety that the Yovel is inviting in people, which is, I, maybe I'd be willing to take the risks. I'd be willing to take the leap of making radical change to transform my society from the one that I have to the one that I need, but I need assurances. The first anxiety was one of manipulation, and the second anxiety is, what makes me, Joe Landowner, believe that what you're asking of me, right, what you're asking me to sacrifice is actually worth the return on the other end? Is it worth it for me to be in it with you for the transformation of the world order? Right, I get it, this is better for everybody. But are you gonna guarantee me, in, as one of the individuals in that everybody, that what I'm getting in return with the transformation of the Ovel is equivalent or better to the economic growth that I've managed to accumulate for myself? I don't, rem I don't remember if Michal actually said this, but uh, Marty Linsky writes that people don't fear, um, don't fear change. We have, this, we have this thing, we believe that people fear change. He says, no, people don't fear change, they fear loss. If you can guarantee people that the, at the end of a change process that they're going through, they will actually have at least what they had at the beginning of a change process, you can move people more effectively along a change process. The Bible knows this, it anticipates this. Why do I keep using this phrase, la vetach? You live on this land in security. It's because what I'm telling you is what you're going to have on the other end of this process is going to be as powerful, as meaningful, as substantive as what you have right now. Why should Joe Landowner, who's not in debt slavery, be willing to throw his lot back in with the Israelite people, be reallocated back to the smaller amount of land that he had at around the time of the division of the land when the Israelites first arrived, in exchange for the promise of the ideal ethical society? Why would I want to do that? The Bible names and acknowledges that what Joe Landowner needs in a moment like this is assurances, guarantees that the consequences of having gone through that change process are going to reward him as much as, if not more so, than what he has given up. And sometimes it does so by humbling him and saying, this land was never yours to begin with. Remember, this was always God's land. That's the stick. And sometimes it does so with the carrot. No, no, you're gonna be reassured. 
Levetach, you're going to live on here in security. Don't worry. The fact that you are making yourself economically vulnerable right now doesn't mean that you are permanently economically vulnerable, and it doesn't mean that you've actually sacrificed more than you've gotten in return. But right in the same story that imagines a messianic transformational politics, that once every 50 years we can come along and reset our society to be exactly the one that it is, embedded in that story is an awareness of quite how difficult um, that is. The messianic story obviously transcends Leviticus 25, and the prophetic image of what the, of what the messianic story <clears throat> is ultimately about is perhaps no, expressed no better place than in Isaiah. <clears throat> this is what we tend to think about when we think about messianism, which is not simply about the reset of land ownership, but the belief that there's going to be a specific moment in time in which the world as we know it ends and the world as we want it begins. And it becomes not just about things as mundane as land ownership, but things as transcendent as peace. There's one day in which this is going to happen. And what's extraordinary is that the, the prophetic vision of what peace is going to look like is not just like today, but better, but a radical transformation of the very conditions of the natural world in which conditions like war and famine and pestilence characterize this world. None of those features are, are going to exist in that world. Famously in Isaiah 11, a shoot will grow out of the stump of Jesse. Um, a twig shall sprout from his stock. The spirit of the Lord will alight upon him, a spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor. Remember, in Leviticus 25, you have to blow a shofar. It doesn't tell us who it is, but it's still we know it's one person is the person who's going to blow the shofar, right? Here, too, part of the messianic political story is the belief in single extraordinary individuals as being the individuals who can actually transform the society that we have into the society that we want. So there's going to be an individual, a shoot, a person coming out of the family of Yeshai, of the family of David. He shall sense the truth by his reverence to the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes behold, nor decide by what his ears perceive. Regular humans simply use their natural sensory faculties to discern what the world is about. This person is going to be a person of great discernment who can transcend the natural faculties of normal humans. He shall judge the poor with equity and decide with justice for the lowly of the land. So far, so good, right? He's a really good person, strong moral fiber, capable of leading with ethics and with sincerity and with conviction and so on. And then we get to verse 6, which I have no idea what to do with. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the kid, the calf, the beast, and the prey, and the fatling together with a little boy to herd them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion like the ox will eat straw. A babe shall play over a viper's hole, and an infant pass his hand over an adder's den. In all of my sacred mounting, nothing evil or vile shall be done, for the land will be filled with a devotion to the Lord as the water covers the sea. Um, in that day, the stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall be standard to all people, right? And then the Lord redeems all of the peoples of the world and not merely the Israelites, and they all stream towards Jerusalem. This messianic story takes the almost prosaic version of the messianic politics of Leviticus 25 and turns it to something poetic, mystical, and almost inaccessibly unimaginable. In Leviticus 25, the story is about simply blow the shofar and transform the society that you want into the society that you've been, the society you have into the society that you want, whereas Isaiah challenges us to imagine that that messianic order is not merely a version of what we have today, but better, right? That's not just the politics of improvement, but the politics of transformation and not, just, not a transformation that we as individuals can ever see ourselves as having a hand in. The prophets represent a kind of, um, what they, one of the things that you, you hear implied in the prophets is that the only person who could write something like this, what Isaiah is depicting, is someone who recognizes the sheer depravity of the very society that you're in. In other words, the more lofty your visions of the society that you want, the more telling it is about the problems of the society that you're in that you perceive. Right? So the, and, and, and the desperation that's implied in this vision of messianism, the desperation that would incline a person to believe that in the world that we want, none of the problems exist. It's not just that, yeah, of course you can't have a lion with a lamb, but we're going to do better to protect the lambs from the lions. 
right? That's like a prose version of this. No, no, what I want to imagine is that the entire, the entire natural conditions of how the world conducts itself no longer operate the way they operate. It, it makes the vision of future so dramatically different than the vision and understanding of the present and past that on one hand it's extraordinarily exciting and the other hand it's debilitating from the perspective of powerlessness. Who are we as individuals to be capable of actually bringing about this world that we want? So messianism has the effect over time of actually being an instrument for Jewish powerlessness. Right? Because I don't, nothing I can do in this world is going to actually transform the world order. Messianism, for much of Jewish history, was actually an instrument of powerlessness. It's not a surprise that Messianism features significantly in ultra-Orthodox anti-opposition uh, to Zionism. It's not your job to bring about a changing of the Jewish political tradition. It's not your job to restore Jewish sovereignty. That's only going to happen when the world gets transformed, when the conditions get changed, when we get sent this extraordinary individual from the, from the tribe of Jesse with, who is ordained and endowed with godly powers. And what it's going to look like is not a banal nation state in the Middle East, petty in its politics, shrill in its parochialism, to quote George Steiner. Right? It's not, not what it's going to look like. What it's going to look like is the ultimate fantasy land that Isaiah is imagining. So messianism, whereas on one hand in the modern parlance, and we'll get to this, is associated with a certain type of coarse power that many of us resist and resent, for much of Jewish history, messianism became actually an instrument for the powerlessness of Jewish activity and powerlessness of Jewish politics. You'll notice, for instance, as a critique of Messianism on page four in the Yerushalmi Antani, talking about Bar Kokhva, who we referenced earlier, Look at just C, the section that says C3. When Rabbi Akiva first said, first saw Bar Kokhva, he would say, this is the king Messiah. This is one of the great, the great pox on Rabbi Akiva's legacy as the greatest of all the sages where he is lousy politics. <laughs> He's our great model of someone who's a great sage with terrible politics. And Rabbi Akiva used to identify him and say, he is the Melech Mashiach. Rabbi Yochanan ben Torto would say to him, Akiva, grass is going to sprout from your cheeks, and the son of David will not yet have come. You're going to be dead a long time before Mashiach actually comes. Akiva's excitement about the presentation of a political figure who promised redemption and salvation to the people was met with deep cynicism and skepticism by the rest of the sages who recognize the very power of messianism. That is, they understand that the world can be transformed, but they recognize that because it brings about a transformation of the world, it is precisely the reason that it is to be feared. You've got to play very carefully and cautiously with individuals who will come along promising Messiah because it is very likely that they will produce something else. If you notice at the end of this long text on the Yerushalmi Ta'anit, which is worth reading, the consequences of Bar Kokhba's messianism as described by the sages are evocatively described here on the bottom of page five. They went about slaughtering them until a horse sunk in the blood up to its nostrils and the blood carried away boulders that weighed 40 sella until it went four miles into the sea. <laughs> and if you think that Betar was close to the sea, behold, it was 40 miles away from the sea. Right? It's like a, they know that the people reading this afterwards don't know geography. Just so you know, literally the land was awash with blood. You can't read the first half of this text. The desire to see messianic transformation of the world in the scheme of Jewish history without to reading it together with the second part of the text, which understands that the consequence of messianic politics are oftentimes bloody. Individuals who seek to bring about a transformation of the world oftentimes do not actually achieve the transformation of the world that they want, um, but they wind up having, they do indeed transform the world, but it doesn't become the messianic age. Nevertheless, even for those who resist messianic politics, the very people who res resist messianic politics, the desire to repress the messianic politics oftentimes turns into a version of the very politics that those people themselves detest. And if you look at the top of page six, and to close off this section on messianism, the Gemara relates Bar Koziva, i.e. Bar Kokhva, the same Bar Kokhva character ruled for two and a half years. He said to the sages, I am the Messiah. 
they said to him, well, with regard to the Messiah, it is written that he is able to smell and judge. They're quoting from a different biblical phrase around what are the characteristics? How do you tell that somebody's actually a Messiah? So they say, okay, you say you're a Messiah. We have a test for that. We're gonna put that test to you. Let's see whether himself, he himself, Bar Kokhba, is able to smell and judge. Once they saw that he was not able to smell and judge, they killed him. Now, it's interesting, by the way, a number of the translations of the Talmud, they change it from they killed him to he was killed. Because I think that they, the rabbis are aware, this is not a great rabbinic text from the perspective of the rabbis, <laughs> right? That they were the ones who killed Bar Kokhba. Nevertheless, I think what's so interesting about this Gemara psychologically is that messianic politics doesn't just become the bad characteristics of the messianic leader who we don't like, but it makes us into crazy people also. This is what we do to messianic figures, right? It's not just what they do, is they, do, they, they demand on us the transformation of the world, and that in itself is violent, but the instinctive response to the messianic figure is also itself violent. Our, in other words, this whole story of messianism, the belief in the quick transformation of the world, is not only violent in its execution, but invites a certain violence in response. I want us to think about the ways in which um, messianic politics are, uh, are unbelievably popular on both the right and the left today. You see, it's tempting for those on the left to look at the messianism of the right and to attribute to it that it actually is messianic, right? So I know some of you studied the writings of Tzvi Yehuda Kuk on the Religion and Politics Day, the son of Rav Kook, who was explicitly a messianist in his theology, especially around the Six Day War, who looked at the Six Day War as the fulfillment of um, a version of God's return to history and an empowerment, an endowment with power to the Jewish people for taking, their, um, taking power into their own hands and creating a new destiny within the land of Israel, who understood that this was not merely the shadow of messianism, that phrase that is still said by the overwhelming number of diaspora Jews in their synagogues, unknowingly channeling a rich messianic tradition. I wonder how many people register that when you say in your synagogues, Reshit smichat gulatenu, the beginning of the flowering of our redemption, you are channeling messianic language that treats this modern political event of the creation of the state of Israel as part of the transformation of history. This is not just merely a secular event, but it invites the messianic era. For Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, this was about turning that from being the, this whiff of something messianic where the world is being transformed to something concrete. No, this is actually the messianic age. And so there's a there's natural skepticism for those on the left to look at those on the right and say, no, no, your messianism is killing us. We hate that messianism. And nevertheless, I sometimes wonder whether the same messianic attitudes appear often on the left in the belief that single actions, single extraordinary individuals, single determinations, simple proclamations could actually bring about also a transformation of history. All we have to do is X and we are different. All we have to do is X and the world is transformed. All we have to do is Y and suddenly the world that we want is more consistent with the visions that we have always had. There's another story in Jewish history which is one that is not about messianic politics, which are in, so way, so many, in, in many ways Marxist history politics, the belief that you, know, we can, you can quickly and readily bring about the transformation of the political world that you want if only you commit yourself to a particular ideology. There's another story in Jewish history about the way in which we are supposed to understand our own politics, and it's what Michael Walzer calls Exodus politics. Exodus politics understands a different understanding of the Exodus story. Walzer notes that the revolutionary idea of history, the cyclicality of history, the belief that something begins and then comes to an end and can get started again, is born in Exodus, but that the real story of the Exodus is about the onerous walking through the desert over 40 years. If you stopped before the Israelites get to the desert, you can believe that overnight a people can be transformed from being slaves to free people. That's like the beginning of the Exodus story. That's the revolutionary messianic politics. All you need is an extraordinary individual who can be the person who transforms a people from being enslaved to free. But then the rest of the Exodus story, which by the way, remember, ends with the Israelites still in the desert. 
I mean, we know what happens next because you can continue reading into later books of Jewish history. But think about how unbelievable it is that the Torah comes to a conclusion at the end of the book of Deuteronomy before the Israelites have actually entered into the promised land as though to suggest the best you can hope for is a journey to the promised land that you get closer and closer to, but that you never in some ways actually arrive there. Exodus politics are fundamentally asymptotic. They approach the limit and never get there. That's what Exodus politics are about. It's about step forwards and step back. It's about, fi about human failures. It's about limitations. It's about fundamentally a certain type of incrementalism. And I don't abandon in the Exodus politics story the vision of what I want to have on the other end. Never abandon the vision, right? The vision helps you keep moving towards the promised land. But Exodus politics are not about the ability to think that I can get to the promised land immediately from here or there, but they are about the rough and onerous and sometimes awful journey through that desert towards the promised land. One example to this effect is a different take that the rabbis offer on what the messianic era looks like, which is on page seven. I'm gonna come back to page six in a second. Rabbi Chia Rabbah and Rabbi Shimon Bar Chalafta were walking in the Arbel Valley at the break of morning before the light of day. They watched the dawn as the light began to shine. Rabbi Chia, the great one in wisdom, said to Rabbi Chalafta, Rabbi, so too unfolds the redemption of Israel in the beginning little by little, and the more it progresses, it increases and grows. Messianic age is not the immediate transformation from dark to light. It is not blow the shofar and restore the conditions of the Yovel. It is not the arrival of an individual who transforms the natural order. It is actually a process that happens with the natural order. So maybe there is some wisdom in the capacity to see the break of dawn and the light of day. There's some wisdom being able to identify we have, a, we have an, an open door in history to be able to act differently in this moment, but never are you supposed to look at that moment and say this is the full articulation of the messianic age. The best you can do is anticipate that you might have a window in history within which to act. The politics of Exodus politics, I think, are best captured in this unbelievable text on page six, a text that I go back to over and over, um, a story of one of the unique, the unique presages of the rabbinic tradition, a character known as Choni HaMe'agel. He is known as Choni the circle drawer because of a different story in the rabbinic tradition a person where he drew a circle famously around himself and said, I'm not moving until it rains and it rained, um, a wise man of, of ancient Judaism who the rabbis are not totally sure what to do with. They know that there are these kind of pre or semi-rabbinic characters around them who have access to a type of wisdom and a type of agency in the world that they themselves don't have, and therefore they tell these um, incredible stories about them where you can sense their ambivalence. Rabbi Yochanan said, all his life that righteous man, i.e. Choni, was troubled by the verse, when the Lord restored the rest restoration of Zion, we were like dreamers. He thought, how can 70 years compare to a dream that lasts one night? After all, the time between the exile, the first exile, and the return to Judea under Cyrus was 70 years. So why does the Bible use this phrase, we were like dreamers, when it actually took 70 years? It didn't happen overnight, as though a person had woken up for a dream. What does it mean for 70 years to feel like it's overnight? One day, Choni was walking along the road when he saw a certain man planting a carob tree. Choni said to him, this tree, after how many years will it bear fruit? Right? What are you doing? You're wasting your time. You're planting something that you're never going to see the fruits of. The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Choni said to him, is it obvious to you that you're going to live another 70 years that you expect to benefit from this tree? You know where this is going, right? What, why would you waste your time on that activity when you're never going to be able to reap the fruits? That man, sa he said to him, that man, um, he said, um, I found, that man is himself, found a world full of carob trees just as my ancestors planted for me. I, too, am planting for my descendants. Launch every speech at a shul dinner in history, <laughs> right? Your job is to merely create the conditions for those who come after you, and lo and behold, you benefited from those who planted before you, not knowing that you would be here, and so on. Now that in and of itself is an unbelievably powerful idea, even though it's exhausting. 
From an Exodus politics idea, this is a very powerful idea that part of our responsibility as people who are active in the world, and here you have to understand that this is connected to the rabbinic critique of messianic politics. You're not going to bring about the transformation of the world overnight, but you might create the conditions today in which the world is transformed in 70 years. That, that in and of itself is not trying to tell you to not be an activist. It's trying to change your orientation towards your activism. You don't get to be rewarded with the activism, with the results that the consequences of your actions are immediately visible to you. But just to, under, just to, to showcase the way in which that is so difficult to handle, the next story that the rabbis tell shows you the failure and the limitation of what it means to truly embrace this kind of um, exodus politics. He sat down to eat his bread. Sleep came upon him. While he slept, a grotto surrounded him and concealed him from sight. Right? Great supernatural story. He has now been surrounded by, um, by a grotto. He's, he essentially, from a literary perspective, he's entering into a womb-like state after which he is going to reemerge as a different person. He slept for 70 years. Judaism was Rip Van Winkle. When he awoke, he saw a man gathering carobs from that very carob tree and eating them. He said to them, do you know who planted this carob tree? And he said, my father's father. And he said, then 70 years were like a dream, literally. I went to sleep, I woke up, and 70 years had passed. And here comes the tragedy. He went to his home. He said to them, does the son of Choni, the circle drawer, still live? What's he asking? Right? Is my own son here? Right? They said to him, he is no more. The son's not alive anymore, but his grandson lives. And Choni now makes the first tragic error. What he's supposed to do is he's the person who's out of place. Remember, the lesson of the first part of the story was you plant carob trees not in spite of the fact that you will not be able to see the fruits of your labor, but because you can't see the fruit of your labor. In other words, your exodus politics pushes us into a place of extraordinary humility about the limitations of our capacity to see change. It's because you can't see them. But what does he respond to when he says, well, he's not here, but the grandson is here. He says, I'm here. I want to stay part of the same story of seeing the change in the world. Not only I want to see it, but I want you to see me. I want to be the person. I want you to continue to see me as the carob planter. Right? These grandchildren are carob trees. Right? But you're not supposed to insist that you, the story is still about you once it's no longer about you. They didn't believe him. Then he goes to the study house, the other place where he had planted carob trees, which were not people, but the, the teachings of Torah. He heard the sages saying, our traditions are as clear today as in the years of Choni the circle drawer. For when he, Choni, used to enter the study house, he used to solve every difficulty that the sages had. So what happens? He walks into a, a Beit Midrash where people are using him as the example of, of the clarity with which Torah is understood, not in order to give him credit for being a great sage, but in order to feel good about their own Torah. Look how great we are. We understand Torah the same way that it used to be understood in the great old days of Choni. Is that true? Who knows? But we do this all the time. The way in which we grant ourselves legitimacy is we treat ourselves as the inheritors of the change agents who come before us, and that in turn license us, licenses us to also be change agents. It enables us to leverage the authority and authenticity of those who came before us in order to be the people who want to bring about the world that we want. But he can't do that. He still needs to be the person in the room. For when he entered the study, he said to them, I am he. They did not believe him, and they did not treat him with the honor that he deserved. He prayed for mercy, and his soul departed. Rava said, thus people say, either fellowship or death. He winds up in this state of existential loneliness because he demands to be the person who is seen as the great change agent in history, as opposed to remembering that his job was exclusively to create the conditions for other people to step up and actually do the work. Now, this is a great text for thinking about rabbis emeritus, right? <laughs> it's a great text for thinking about transitions and change processes. What does it mean to get out of the way, right? Um, what does it mean to get out of the way and give over the work to other people? 
In what ways do people linger well beyond their legacies and create awkward conditions for those who come next? It's still a rebuke here implied of the people and not just Choni, because even if the rabbi overstays his welcome, they're told you're still supposed to treat this person with respect and they fail to do so. Nevertheless, the primary rebuke is that you failed to be the person who you were in the epigram. The epigram was, you plant trees now, and they produce fruit later, and your job is to simply be a fruit tree planter. If you think that your job is to actually transform a civilization, to blow a shofar, and bring about that transformation, you are wrong. Your job is to create the conditions by which people will move the ball down the field later on in your lifetime. That messianic, that exodus politics, I won't read this inside, but I'll give it to you for further reading. Um, is, is, is consistent with how Maimonides re-renders the teachings of Isaiah about the Messianic age. Maimonides says famously, oh, that whole wolf and lamb business, that's a metaphor. We're not actu we don't actually imagine that the transformation of the world that we want is one that requires of, requires of us a massive transformation of the world order. All we have to do is to continue to incrementally try to create the change that we want. And for Maimonides, the Messiah, he can't dismiss the Messiah altogether, but he can radically redefine it. And so for Maimonides, the Messiah is an outcome to politics rather than a catalyst to politics. And when you read Isaiah, it sounds like what the Messiah is is an extraordinary individual who's gonna bring about a transformation of the world order. The Rambam turns it into something different and says, if somebody winds up enabling the Jewish people to achieve political sovereignty and security on land, and they do all the things that the Messiah is supposed to do, then retroactively, it turns out that that person is the Messiah. Right? And that is gonna incline you to a totally different political orientation in which your job is to not to try to find the extraordinary individuals who bring about the transformation of the world overnight. It's gonna disincentivize you from being in the transformation business altogether. It's gonna remind you about the slow iterative process and pace of change that politics are supposed to lead. I'm, I'm, I wanna name for you that one of the you know, a lot of this is based on, um, on Walzer, which I've given you as text here. Um, Walzer summarizes um, what he imagines as Exodus politics. He names, he names the, the ways in which messianic politics have characterized a feature of the Zionist story all along. But at the end of the Walzer text here on Exodus and Revolution on page 16, he summarizes what he describes as the central impetus of Exodus politics, which is one in which we don't imagine that the world is transformed overnight, but through slow processes of change, he says as follows. Uh, we read this at our Seder. Um, so pharaonic oppression, deliver oppression, deliverance, Sinai and Canaan are still with us, powerful memories shaping our perceptions of the political world. The door of hope is still open. Things are not what they might be, even when what they might be isn't totally different from what they are. This is a central theme in Western thought, always present though elaborated in many different ways. We still believe, or many of us do, what the Exodus first taught, or what has commonly been taken to teach about the meaning and possibility of politics and about its proper form. First, that wherever you live, it is probably Egypt. Second, that there is a better place, a world more attractive, a promised land. And third, that the way to the land is through the wilderness. There is no way to get from here to there except by joining together and marching. I wanna notice that there are, I have set up two paradigms here, one of messianic politics and one of exodus politics. There is a third, there is a third paradigm that I wanna name that I actually think characterizes most Jewish politics and that messianic politics and exodus politics are not antonyms to one another. They are both antonyms to a third type of politics, which is the politics of status quo. And while messianic politics has a long Zionist history, mostly on the right, and while Exodus politics has a long Zionist history in Zionist authors who shifted away from the, pre from the messianism um, of Jewish tradition and sought a pragmatism that correlates with Exodus politics, to my view, the only political story for the Jewish people that has no serious textual antecedent and no Zionist credibility is the politics of status quo. 
That, is, that is, seems to me antithetical to the notion of what Zionism meant to be, which was the desire to claim the story of the Jewish people in our hands and to try to create iterative steps towards bringing about the world that we want, either through the messianic frame and the hope of a transformation of the world order, or at least through the exodus frame of understanding that the only way to the promised land is through joining together uh, and, mar and marching. I want to conclude with four modern mediators who help to hold the tension between the messianic story and the pragmatic story. Four different strategies, because I know that this is all theoretical. What does it mean to be a messianic politics and what it means to do exodus politics? I want to suggest that there are ways within the context of Jewish politics and theology and behavior to hold the tension between the aspirations for the world that the messianic story wants us to, to hold on to the Exodus politics doesn't abandon the Messianic, it just, it, it just, it just is scared by it. <laughs> it believes that it makes us do crazy things. It makes us crazy about why isn't the world fixing itself as fast as we want it to. I need to hold on to that vision, to, that, to the magnificent vision of the lion lying down with the lamb. I need to hold on to it, even though I don't want to do in the world the types of things that, would require, um, that I would require of me to do in order to bring it about. There's a famous old joke, about you, can, you can have a lion lie down with a lamb, you just have to change the lamb every day, right? <laughs> so I, I know... I, I want to hold on to that story. I just know that I can't politically, I can't actually politically do it. And I don't want to be stuck in the reductive banality of Exodus politics, right, as its own, as, as the entirety to the thing. I want to suggest four, um, four tools, law, politics, uh, prayer, and pragmatism. These to me are, you know, the risk of being a little chutzpahdik. This is to me, I think, the post-Messianic fourfold song for Jewish politics, right? Which is, what way is law, politics, prayer, and pragmatism. I want to allude to, law is alluded to in Robert Cover's you know, magnificent Nomos and Narrative uh, article from 1982, who describes the way in which law bridges the gap, as he says in the middle of page 17, Law may be viewed as a system of tension or a bridge linking a concept of a reality to an imagined alternative. That is a connective between two states of affairs, both of which can be represented in their normative significance only through the devices of narratives. Skip down to the bottom and then we'll unpack this. Our visions hold our reality up to us as unredeemed. By themselves, the alternative visions, world of our visions, the lying lying down with the lamb, the creditor forgiving debts each seventh year, the state all shriveled and withered away, dictate no particular sets of transformations or efforts at transformation. Right? They are so radically different than the world that we have that they give us no pathway to understand how to actually get there. But law gives a vision depth of field by placing one part of it in the highlight of insistent and immediate demand while casting another part in the shadow of the millennium. Law is that which licenses in blood certain transformations while authorizing others only by unanimous consent. Law is a force like gravity through which our worlds exercise an influence upon one another, a force that affects the courses of these worlds through normative space, and law is that which holds our reality apart from our vision and rescues us from the eschatology that is a collision in this material social world of the constructions of our minds. We need more time to unpack this, but what I think Cover is giving us as a tool is that law operates within, the, within these visionary stories. It's not about abandonment of a messianic story and the reduction to pure pragmatism, but is the exercise through the building blocks of social order that we actually bridge the gap between the world that we have and the world that we want. In what ways are we thinking as a Jewish people in our politics about law, and here I mean both halakha, Jewish law, and Israeli law, and law as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a mechanism by which we actually create, we close social gaps, rather than imagining that our politics demand of us to tell big stories, to, to preach for immediate transformations without giving us the tools and the mechanisms to actually bring that about. The second, um, 
The second piece I said was politics, and here I go to Hannah Arendt, um, a Jewish political thinker who I think um, was about 50 or 60 years um, either before or, um, or after her appropriate time, and therefore served as a kind of Jewish political dissident in her own era, even though the stuff that she's writing, if she was writing it today, would be very consistent with the thinking on the, on the very mainstream American Jewish left. And one of the things she says in this article on Jewish politics is, those peoples in the second paragraph who do not make history but simply suffer it tend to see themselves as the victims of meaningless, overpowering, inhuman events, tend to lay in their hands, to lay, lay their hands in their laps and wait for miracles that never happen. If in the course of this war, she's writing this in the middle of the Second World War, we do not awaken from this apathy, there will be no place for us in tomorrow's world. Perhaps our enemies will not have succeeded in annihilating us totally, but those of us who are left will be little more than living corpses. Arendt is seeking for an awakening of Jewish politics that are rooted in ideals and ideology. As she says in the next line, the only political ideals an oppressed people can have are freedom and justice. Our politics, what she's asking for, is not merely the real politique that sometimes you hear here in this country, that people who have ideals are um, pathetic. There is sometimes a demonization of idealism in the Israeli political discourse. Arendt is saying, no, that's actually the instrument by which a people actually retrieves its dignity is through idealist politics. But it's politics nonetheless. <laughs> It's not idealism in its own right, it's idealism translated into political pragmatism. The third piece I want you to think about is prayer. And here I'm not gonna read it, but I have it for you from Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, who tries to ask in this article, and doesn't fully answer it, whether there is a way for Jews to have non-Messianic hope. It's a great question. <laughs> When have Jews dreamed or hoped for a better future that has not operated through the context of messianism? And one of the examples that he gives is through prayer. Now, I don't mean to push prayer from the perspective of um, as a theological or behavioral category. I myself am not a huge prayer person. I'm trying to use prayer as a category of thinking that keeps us connected to the language of hope but does not always think that hope is exercised through politics. Arendt, politics. Prayer, a different discipline. When the Jewish people abandon their hope that they are not simply working in their politics to bring about, but dreaming about and whispering about and organizing our religious and spiritual lives about, we are forfeiting a piece of hopefulness to the Messianists. They are not the only hopeful ones. <laughs> And there are ways in which we can exercise and galvanize our hopefulness through political processes. And then there are also disciplines of recognizing that hope is not a category that is reduced entirely to politics. The final text I want to look at together with you is this unbelievable piece by Isaiah Berlin from 1994. I wish I could read the whole thing. I can't. But just look at page 25. You could take it with you and, and read it in shul or not shul. <laughs> Um, let me explain, if you are truly convinced that there is some solution to all human problems, that one can conceive an ideal society which men can reach, if only they do what is necessary to attain it, then you and your followers must believe that no price can be too high to pay in order to open the gates of such a paradise. Only the stupid and malevolent will resist once certain simple truths are put to them. Those who resist must be persuaded, and if they cannot be persuaded, laws must be passed to restrain them. If that doesn't work, then coercion, if need be violence, will inevitably have to be used. If necessary, terror, slaughter. Lenin believed this after reading Das Kapital and consistently thought, taught that if a just, peaceful, happy, free, virtuous society could be created by the means he advocated, then the end justified any me methods that needed to be used, literally any. The root conviction which underlies this is that the central questions of human life, individual or social, have one true answer which can be discovered. It can, can and must be implemented, and those who have found it are the leaders whose word is law. Skip to the next paragraph. This is the idea of which I spoke, and I wish to tell you that it is false. Not only because the solutions given by different schools of social thought differ, and none can be demonstrated by rational methods, but for an even deeper reason, the central values by which most men have lived in a great many lands and in a great many times, these values, almost if not entirely universal, are not always harmonious with each other. Some are and some not. Um, 
Men have always craved for liberty, security, equality, happiness, justice, knowledge, and so on, but complete liberty is not compatible with complete equality. If men were wholly free, the wolves would be free to eat the sheep. I'll skip down to the, the next page where he says, I am afraid I have no dramatic answer to offer, only that if these human values by which we live are to be pursued, then compromises, trade-offs, arrangements have to be made if the worst is not to happen. So much liberty for so much equality, so much individual self-expression for so much security. Uh, so much justice for so much compassion. My point is that some values clash. The ends pursued by human beings are all generated by our common nature, but their pursuit has to be some degree controlled. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness, I repeat, may not be fully compatible with each other, nor are liberty, equality, and fraternity. Well, this is the last paragraph so I'll read. So we must weigh and measure, bargain and compromise, and prevent the crushing of one form of, his life, of life by its rivals. I know only too well that this is not a flag under which idealistic and enthusiastic young men and women may wish to march. It seems too tame, too reasonable, too bourgeois. It does not engage the generous emotions. But you must believe me, one cannot have everything one wants, not only in practice, but even in theory. The denial of this, the search for a single overarching ideal because it is the one and only true one for humanity inevitably, invariably leads to coercion. And then to destruction, to blood. Eggs are broken, but the omelet is not in sight. There is only an infinite number of eggs, human lives ready for the breaking. And in the end, the passionate idealists forget the omelet and just go on breaking eggs. Berlin's lesson of the 20th century is that the Marxist politics that define the idealism of the 20th century and which translate into enormous and devastating consequences for Western civilization cannot hold. And where he uses the language of pragmatism, I'll instead use the language of pluralism. Let me conclude as follows. <clears throat> So I argue that neither messianism nor status quoism are really functional for Jewish politics or for Zionism. And there's a tragedy for Zionism in the obsession with both messianism and status quoism as the dominant stories that the Jewish people carry right now as 50 years from 2017. In some ways, what I think I'm hoping for here is that 1967 screwed us up. And one of the ways that it screwed us up was by introducing messianism as so much of a feature of what it meant to be a Zionist it actually introduced an anomaly in the definition of Zionism that's actually deeply at odds with 1917, the pragmatism of 17 and 47, and deeply at odds with what the Jewish people, Jewish politics, and the state of Israel actually need today. Um, I want 1967, as it relates to Zionism, to be an outlier for the massive claim that it makes on Jewish politics and not its characteristic or its, its definer. In some ways, 67, with its insistence both on the messianic politics of those who like the result of 67 and the messianic politics that are of those who are seeking to end the legacy of 67, has gotten into our heads and into the exodus politics that have, been mean, have meant to characterize Zionism from the beginning. And I guess I find myself and the Jewish people caught between the, um, the impetuses of urgency that are created by the passage of time and by these milestone markers and the recognition that lack of humility in relationship to these is a spiritual challenge. My big hope is that we become a people ambitious in our dreams and humble in our politics. Thank you. And just for the record, I started late, so I went late. Yes. Yeah, I, I find myself referencing and really struggling with not as much two-state solution types um, as much as and the occupation types. Um, there's a there is a common there's actually a common trope which I find what I what I really am that I really struggle with on both the right and the left, which is the right's unwillingness to acknowledge that the consequence of its incremental politics are going to actually have to deal with the Palestinians at some point. Um, and you, you find this oftentimes in the Bennett types of, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. When, and, and, and the resistance to the language of apartheid, which is offered as the 
theoretically won't you find yourself in apartheid is don't use the word apartheid, that's what people will say, and we'll cross the bridge with the Palestinians when they come to it, and I'm resisting that entirely as being an unpragmatic form of, um, of avoidance. And I, am, I struggle often with, and I, I talk a lot to, to the folks who say, our job is to preach and the occupation, but when I ask, what are the steps that you would take to do that, and what are the consequences you would have to endure once that actually comes about, they say, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to get people to talk about ending, just ending the occupation. And those both feel to me like total folly. They feel actually highly messianic. Um, yes, other hands, go ahead. Um, so So some people are pressed and will use the language of Milchemet Gog Magog, um, the imaginary great war after which, um, after which the Messiah will come. God help us, I hope I'm not alive for when that happens. Um, um, I, I believe that people oftentimes use messianic language to imply we are powerless in the story, right? And, and greater forces than us are gonna wind up yielding these great wars that are gonna produce the messianic age. But what is deceptive to me about it is that they are participants in the cataclysmic and apocalyptic processes that are gonna bring about those wars. So it's one thing to say, I'm gonna sit out history and wait for it to happen and wait for it to be taken over. That's, okay, you wanna play that game. I don't think, I think the, the condition of the Jewish people no longer allows for a passive orientation, uh, orientation towards history. But um, it's not, you can't do that and also be involved in the apocalyptic processes that are bringing those wars about. Yes? I guess I just want to push you again in your answer to Mitchell's question, which is to say that I think I find the clemency problematic between messianism on the right and the left. On the right, you have actual messianism and people that see the state as a means for fulfilling their eschatological fantasies. And, and you do have a far left, you also have a moderate left, a responsible left, especially in this country, that is not operating on some naive assumptions, but is really operating according to serious security concerns and a, a, a sober analysis of the situation, including the vast majority of the Israeli security establishment. So I guess, I, again, I find influency problematic. Maybe on the far left, you do have a kind of messianism in a way, but it's very different than the actual messianism you have on the right. So, uh, look, I... Um I, I identify in my own politics with a lot of people you're talking about. What I, and what, what, I'm, what I'm pushing you back to do is to notice, you're resisting the equivalency, but acknowledging that there may actually be people who, to whom I'm drawing the equivalence who are not you, <laughs> who you don't identify with. And, and I guess your resistance is that you're, you're claiming that messianism is, is actual technical vocabulary on one side, and it's not technical vocabulary on the other side. And my resistance to that is that actually messianism is more than simply the technical vocabulary as it's operated within this intellectual tradition, it is reflective of also a concept of an orientation towards history and a concept of an orientation towards politics. And, and, and the same way that, and I think and Arendt does this, and, um, and Yerushalmi acknowledges this, and Berlin acknowledges this, Marxism never talked about itself as being messianic, but was a messianic political movement. And, and Berlin's resistance is to the belief that it is through a passionate commit to, commitment to idealism alone, right, that that alone winds up actually doing exactly the same types of toxicity to its societies that it seeks to rid itself of. So I want you to, I want you to ask, not just, not just um, about the technical vocabulary, but where do you see these categories actually playing out independent of whether people actually call themselves messianic. And my hypothesis is that it's there. Yes? along the realities uh, that surround it's not only us who are 
to decide which are our under in the different positions, but we are driven by very powerful uh, mm -hmm. forces. Great. Agreed. Yes. So we're talking to the diaspora Jews, okay, here, what you want was beyond. Beyond what? One thing I want from us um, as Jews in America is, um, number one, um, the American Jewish community is allowing, um, is allowing itself to become an additional victim of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. An additional victim of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, this is happening through a narrowing of the legitimacy of political viewpoints in the American Jewish community um, that is creating generational challenges, is creating political challenges, and that ironically and strangely has created a much narrower band of political discourse about Israel in the American Jewish community than exists in Israel between Israelis. Makes no sense. So number one, that's one piece. Number two, I want us to think in taxonomical, historical, and political categories about what it is that we seek in our politics. Um, I find that we as American Jews are oftentimes passive in the political theories that under which we operate. I want us to put, put your own politics in context. Who are you relative to the story? And one of the things that it invites us to do is to understand who are others relative to the story. They're all on the source sheet. <laughs> And if we actually see ourselves as all in the source sheet, it gets us closer back to goal number one, in which we see that our politics are playing out much bigger stories than simply our attitudes about the conflict. And the third, um, I don't want American Jews to stop their activism in one direction or another about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but a rent-like, I want it to be noble. That's what I want. I want it to be noble. Yes? You identified the moderate Sure. What does it look like and what are the goals? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there is, uh, I find it self-evidently that there's a, a moderate non-Messianic right. Um, I think many American Jews are moderate non-Messianic right, rightists um, when they're not status quoists. Um, when it's not merely about abandonment of the status quo, but about what, are the, what would be the incremental steps to bring it about. I think you heard from some speakers who are moderate non-Messianic right-wingers. Um, I don't want to use any names, but you, I, I, think that, I think that they're there. I don't think, um, I think that they're, I think part of, part of the, the fabrication of a real, of a moderate voice is, you know, based on Michal's presentation, the shifting away from um, political activism as the only tool to moral activism could actually create the possibility of incremental, incremental progress towards improving the conditions under which this conflict is negotiated, even if it doesn't actually end the conflict as quickly as people would like. Yes, in the back. Um, I just want to clarify, you said you want them to act nobly, and then it's not how you, you use the term moral activism. And so I guess I just want you to drill into what that actually looks like. Not in terms of discourse, but also in terms of actions. Um, hmm. The question is about what, what, um, what does nobly look like? Um, well, first I would suggest reading the rest of Arendt, um, who caricatures, um, caricatures Jewish leaders who are fixated on realpolitik that it's only about what's, um, what's achievable and not about what we dream for. Um, I, th I don't know, I, maybe I'm being naive. I, I would like it to be kinder. That's what noble looks to me. It's kinder. Um, yeah. So if we use Arendt's model of uh, this idealistic Jewish politics, freedom and justice, uh, and we look out at this conflict and we say Judenrein is totally against freedom and justice, and it's against the spirit of international order. Europe has open borders. They're trying to keep them, keep them in the face of that. Why isn't the vision, rather than a vision of let's end the occupation, of a vision of a much more integrated Middle East, and therefore settlers are willing to live in, in a Palestinian state, which is somehow confederated with Jordan, that there's, there are different 
more open-minded visions of a general of, 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 of a solution rather than this law. Those are not 20th century notions. 21st century notions are closer to Europe's vision of open borders. Why isn't that good one justice? It's possible. Look, I um, I was born and raised on the two-state solution. That's part of my um, it's part of my family biography. <laughs> um, it is not. It's not easy for me. Um, apropos, uh, again, Michal's talk yesterday. It's not easy for me to reconcile myself to rethinking the map around two state, one state, um, and to reconcile to the fact that what has se what has felt like an orthodoxy to me for a long time of the two state solution is the only possible legitimate outcome that's going to create moral conditions under which Israelis and Palestinians live, to actually say, what would happen if that's not the only option? Do I simply go down in flames? Or do I say, how do I reconcile myself to the, to the transformation of this conflict, which is an openness towards, towards one state models? That, that, it's, even, it's hard for me to say the words out loud. Um, but I don't know, I don't know I, I, what, I'm, what I'm sitting with and holding and struggling with is that I also don't want to be a fundamentalist to a two-state solution. What happens if, if um, there is a fun, there's a certain type of fundamentalism that comes with two-state solutionism, which, um, which leads us to not see Israelis sometimes and leads us oftentimes to actually not see Palestinians. There have been, it, there, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who advocate for a two-state solution who use the language of divorce between Israelis and Palestinians, which doesn't, which is not, that's not, doesn't feel to me like a humane way of recognizing that we're living in a relatively small um, area of land with much deeper ethnic, religious, and political codependence, interdependencies, and relationships than is imagined by simply the charting of a political solution. I want a two-state solution very badly. I still believe it is by far the most moral no, no, don't do that, please. Um, I, I believe it's by far the most, you know, we just, we can't do that. We can't, um, you know, um, by far the most, mo you know, a on paper and in the current realities, by f to me, the, 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 by far the best moral and political solution. But here I am wrestling with that against a desire for it not to actually corrupt and co-opt our politics from being as, as aspirational, as moral as we want them to be. What happens if it turns out that a moral position politically turns into um, to immoral politics as the journey to actually get there? That's what I'm trying to square the circle of. Yes? I'm also, I mean, I'm also challenged, which is in a wonderful way by much you're saying, but I am still challenged by the use of the term messianism for the left as well as for the right. And the reason for me, at least for me, is that when I talk to very often people on the right about, about their view, it's a physical-based view. If we have the land, certain land, is part of the my requirement. I don't get that same concept at all of a particular view, but of a process. <coughs> specifically aimed at hearing the voices of the other. So when we have a program like last, like last night, and we have someone say, this is what the Arab villages around me are thinking. I want to hear the voices from the Arabs themselves, not from someone as a mediator. When I hear Micah telling us what his solutions are, I don't hear the need to engage those of the others. What I hear as a compassionate, noble process is to really engage with the others as a core value of the liberal or the left point of view. And so for me, it's more of a process in many ways than an actual vision. I'm asking you to think about messianism as both capital M and lowercase m. I'm asking you to think about messianism with uppercase M as, in, as consistent in these texts as being a concrete political program that's been advanced by with a certain religious orientation. And I'm asking you to think about the lowercase M as a, as a piece of, um, of, of phenomenological language that describes the belief that the world can be transformed overnight that describes the belief that is through single exceptional individuals that that happens, the belief that there are single isolated acts which bring about the world that we want, um, and then to, to try to see whether imaginatively we can stretch to invite the possibility that those types of behaviors are mirrored even without the specific vocabulary that comes with the uppercase M. Um, I think one last one in the back, yeah.
Is there a question? Um, <laughs> Let me take one more question. I got it. We'll take one more question. Um, yes, sir. Um, I wonder if you, because of the, uh, the discomfort people are having with medicineism, I wonder if, in fact, what you're talking about is utopianism. Utopianism and messianism are related to each other. Um, uh, and, and in fact, that's Isaiah 11, uh, is the imagine, imagining of that kind of place. Um, in, the Greek, in the Greek roots of utopianism, uh, it's two different Greek words. One is um, the ideal place and one is no place. Uh, so there's an awareness that the construction of an ideal reality is also uh, in some ways impossible. Um, and if it's useful, at least as the subordinate clause to the lowercase messianism to think about a utopianism, then, then I hope it is. Anyway, thank you, everybody.